So the Master Gardener program, a lot of people think that you have to be an expert on a gardening topic to become a part of it, but really we're people who love plants or love learning and want to make a difference in our community. I had always had an interest in gardening, but I finally decided to act on it and get a little bit more involved after I got my first home. My favorite aspect is talking to new and novice gardeners and trying to get them interested in it the way I started out. Master Gardeners are a part of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach and they're really helping their communities by building knowledge and also increasing access to different types of plants through their plant sales or maybe educating people through their demonstration gardens. The education that comes out of interaction with other master gardeners, volunteering in the gardens, as well as participating in the education sessions is what I look forward to. So if you love nature, you want to make things better in your community, in your backyard, this is a very good program to help you do so. To become a master gardener, someone has to go through the master gardener training. One of my favorite parts of the master gardener training is when everybody comes to Iowa State University and we call it class on campus. And it's such a fun day because people really want to be there. They just want to learn more. One of the main reasons I started with the Master Gardener program was because I really wanted the education. I learned from the people and they learn from me, so we share all the knowledge that we gather. With the self-confidence of learning more about things and um, you know trying different things, I'm more educated, I can kind of pass that on to my kids and it's fun to be able to give back. Master Gardener volunteers are amazing. They're these people who build partnerships and get things rolling in their community, whether it's volunteering as a Master Gardener as part of the county fair or supporting 4-H youth who are really interested in vegetables or some other types of plants. Master Gardener volunteers can be a part of these different types of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach programs to really work as volunteers to extend the mission of Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Hello everyone, welcome back to the virtual Suling Garden Show. We are so excited to have you all here today. Um, we are just going to be starting week two, so we are on our third session today. So I'm gonna quick pull up our welcome PowerPoint. All right, so I just wanna encourage everyone to remember to join us in the comments. So if you're joining us on Facebook Live today, go ahead and jump into the comments. Let us know where you're from. And we'd also love to know if you're a master gardener. If you're watching on our um, website, uh, you can find the evaluation link later and you can let us know where you guys are joining us from. Um, and if you're a master gardener, we'd love to hear that too. So we'll share that information on where you can find um, the evaluation link for that to chat with us later. If you're watching on the website, feel free to jump over to our Facebook page. If you'd love to interact in the comments, that's gonna be the easiest way for you to do that. Um, so there is actually a direct link um, from the website to Facebook. So if you're interested in joining the Facebook Live. Uh, so we have a ton of great topics still. We are running all the way through March 26th, every Friday at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. So this afternoon, we are uh, going to be talking about busting garden myths. Um, and that is sponsored by Les Hills Wild Ones. So feel free to join us at 3 p.m. Central Time um, for another uh, virtual Soothing Garden Show session. Of course, I always love to... I give a big shout out to the Siouxland Garden Show Committee. So this is a collaborative effort between Iowa State University Extension and Outreach in Woodbury County, as well as Nebraska Extension, Dakota County. So we have uh, Carrie King, Carol Larvik, Molly Hewitt, myself, Caitlin Brinkerhoff, we have Kevin Potabom, Emily Yaki, and then the bottom row are three master gardeners that sit on our committee um, and help us plan all of our sessions. We have Rex Towns, Randy Burnight, and Diana Kincaid. Uh, so this committee works hard to plan our in-person garden shows as well as our virtual garden shows. So uh, back in about September, we had to make the tough decision to go virtual. Um, and it's been really exciting because we still have to or still are able to present all these great educational sessions for uh, master gardeners and garden enthusiasts. However, I do want you guys to save the date for our 2022 show. We are hoping to be back in person. It's going to be Friday, April 2nd and Saturday, April 3rd, and we're gonna be at the Marriott Center in South Sioux City, Nebraska. So this is two full days uh, for you guys to shop, learn, and grow. 
We'll still have educational sessions. We'll have uh, vendors, uh, garden vendors out providing plants, seedlings, education, um, and lots of other great things. It's only five dollars to get into the um, session or into the garden show. Um, but just a reminder, all of our virtual sessions are free. And of course, a big thank you to all of our volunteers and vendors. We have about over 70 volunteers, uh, Master Gardener volunteers that help us put on the Siouxland Garden Show every year. Um, so we really miss working with everyone and we're very uh, eager to get back into person in 2022 um, and we miss everyone greatly. And to our over 40 vendors uh, that come out to the Garden Show as well, we're really looking forward to getting back in person. Um, and we thank you guys for being dedicated uh, volunteers and vendors to the Siouxland Garden Show and we're looking forward to 2022. And a big thank you to our sponsors. Uh, just a reminder, our sponsor for each session is going to be up in the left-hand corner. So today it's Nebraska Extension. Um, but we're very thankful for all of our sponsors that help put us on, on uh, all of our uh, virtual education series and as well as our in-person. All right. So now what we've all been waiting for, um, I'm going to go ahead and get Kim up onto the screen. And we are going to switch out uh, PowerPoints here. We are so excited to have you join us here uh, today, Kim. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. I love doing this. I just wish I could do it in person. <laughs> awesome. So um, I got your PowerPoint all pulled up here. So I'm going to go ahead and take myself off screen. And the floor is yours, Kim. Excellent. Thanks so much. Well, good morning, all. I love roses uh, by any name. And of course, I chose that title on purpose. And Part of the reason I love them is what you see on that screen is a dozen yellow roses that show up at my house from someone to whom I've been married for 45 years because he caught me by sending me a dozen yellow roses a day for a week until I'd finally go out with him once. And the rest is history, two sons, five grandchildren and 45 years later. So next slide, please, Caitlin. Just a, just a little bit of a tease and a start on the classifications of roses. When I teach this in my classes, of course, I overwhelm students by talking about what the possibilities are. The wonderful species roses, and we have several that, of course, are truly wild, straight species in Iowa, Nebraska, really all over the, the country. The old garden roses, when I was landscape architect for the university, we had a planting that I initiated that was only old garden roses because the University of Nebraska was chartered in 1867. And there were some real beauties associated with that. Then we have the modern roses. 1867 might not feel very modern, but uh, that's what they're called. And those are the ones that people are mostly familiar with. Of course, then the modern shrub roses, which took the world by storm, hybrid rugosas, and then just various classifications by which the roses are sold. So it's, uh, it's a little confusing. The long and the short of it is they're all still roses. Next one, Caitlin. And of course, the rose is America's national flower, one of those things we can actually agree to. On the left, we have one that is called Grandma's Blessing, which is one of the Easy Elegance series. And then on the right, I think that is probably just one of the old nearly wilds in a big old bunch in a bouquet. So lots and lots of uh, selection, breeding, fun, uh, fun experimentation with roses has gone on, of course, with not only rosarians, but also with master gardeners and people who just love those flowers. Next one, Caitlin. So many of you or some of you may have heirlooms or the old garden roses. I think really there is nothing more beautiful than a, a, a beautiful scrambler or a rambler that is crawling over a fence or somewhere in a landscape. You know, maybe they're not the greatest in terms of disease resistance. Maybe they are a little bit of a pain to manage, but when they put on their beautiful show, who cares? And that is one of the uses. I, I really can't talk about roses without talking about how we use them in the landscape. And of course, that is um, a big piece of what makes any landscape personal to the person whose landscape it is. 
I, I tell uh, clients, I tell students, I tell master gardeners, I can give you advice, but I don't live there. I, I can't get inside your mind and say, I love that, I hate that. So you get to choose as you're looking at those roses, what you would love to have in your own landscape or not. Next one, Caitlin. So, you know, really traditional uh, rose gardens, and, and we're fortunate in uh, the eastern part of the state, we have the Heyman Rose Garden, which is uh, in Lincoln near Sunken Gardens. And we have, of course, Lauritsen Gardens, which has a beautiful rose garden. I know Iowa State has one as well. And very traditional, very classy, uh, the structure, the, the supporting plant material around it that helps set those roses off. And of course, these are the kinds of exhibits where people can go to just totally enjoy and, and walk and experience roses and then make the decisions about whether they want them in their own landscape. Next slide. When they're in their glory, this is what they look like. It is just breathtaking. This one at Heyman, uh, without the master gardeners, I'm certain this would not exist um, because they are the ones who do all of the cleanup, all the cutback, all the deadheading, all the scouting, all of the education on certain days, all of the trying to keep those labels in place when of course in a public space, <laughs> the labels are one of the, one of the elements of a garden that seems to disappear, whether it gets uh, plucked off by a darn crow or kicked over by somebody who's not paying attention. But the number of visitors who come to enjoy the roses and then hopefully take away from them a little bit of understanding about some of the differences between hybrid teas as an example or the shrub roses. Because of course that does make a huge difference in terms of what you are going to have to do or choose to do to manage those roses. Next one. So the modern shrub rose is, is really a, a breakthrough in the, in the rose world. And the one on the left is yellow submarine. For the life of me, I can't remember the one on the right. But what I did years and years ago when I came back to, uh, to uh, Nebraska on the teaching faculty, I did uh, a trial for Bailey as they were just releasing their Easy Elegance series. We had some number of roses exceeding 50 or 60. We, we set them out in trials, we monitored, we watched for three years. And it was pretty interesting both for us and for uh, Bailey Nursery, because of course, just like most plants in the landscape, our roses did not read the book. And some of them uh, got way larger than uh, we thought. Some of them succumbed to good old Nebraska weather. But the long and the short of it is, the modern shrub rose has given us amazing um, capabilities of using roses in different ways in the landscape. Caitlin, next. This happens to be one of the other uh, categories, of course, of roses that um, are just beloved. I mentioned earlier the heirloom scrambling over the fence. This is a new dawn rose that by the time it, uh, by the time the owner who planted it finally moved, this particular single rose was 40 feet long. And uh, obviously she cared for it beautifully. She used the right fertilizer, she pruned properly. It was absolutely breathtaking. And you know, to be able to have this kind of an element in a landscape is just, it's really just a fascinating, wonderful element. Next slide. So, you know, another category that is uh, tough as a box of rocks is the Ragosa roses plus their hybrids. And there has been a, a fair amount of hybridization on the Ragosas. I happen to be a real fan of pretty much any landscape plant that gives you great beauty, low input for, and high impact for low input. Ragosa roses are one of those. And of course they will form a, a very large very thorny, <laughs> shrubby, uh, sort of a mass in the landscape if you allow them to do that. The color range is a little bit limited on the Ragosas plus the hybrids. Lots of pinks, lots of whites, a little handful of yellow, not a real stable color in Ragosa roses. And of course the word Ragosa or Ragosa means that rough foliage on the leaves. 
which is one of the elements that really helps these roses withstand some of the ills and evils that attack the others. Beautiful thing about the rugosas is they are incredibly sweetly scented, which uh, again, unfortunately, in a lot of rose breeding, one of, the, one of the characteristics that has been sacrificed in some cases is the scent itself. And if you choose uh, particularly different hybrids, you're going to get the fabulous hips so you get great winter interest. So you don't really see as many selections of Rugosa roses for sale in garden centers as you do hybrid teas, grandifloras, and the shrub roses, because again, the character is a little bit different. But again, it's one of those uh, options that is available to you if you really like the roses. Next slide. So as we look at and think about how roses are used in the landscape, this is a kind of a classic example of, of what has happened either in public spaces or commercial spaces where people would like a shrub that flowers profusely and ideally all the time, which is a little bit of a misconception. So that's one of those garden myths that might get busted. This is on campus and uh, clearly since we are go big red, we have to use red roses on campus. The upside is pretty fabulous when they are in flower. The downside is for our landscape management people who have to take care of them. That's a lot of thorny canes to have to deal with. And again, but again, it gives you uh, the capability of doing a very simple, clean landscape if you, if you choose a shrub rose that is uniform in color character and really sets off the, uh, the architecture of the surrounding space. Next slide. This is a kind of a fun older image when uh, shrub roses were fairly new on the market. And it really attests to one of the elements that made um, the breeding so exciting. And that was uh, the hardiness issue. So hardiness of the shrub roses ability to withstand uh, pretty dreadful conditions along a major arterial street surrounded by concrete, not irrigated uh, other than on occasion, which is maybe not the best for roses, but these survived and thrived uh, for years and years in downtown Lincoln until they finally reached a, a point in their lifespan where it was time to uh, let them go, which is again a reminder, there are roses that are going to live for five years and there are roses that are going to live for 50, sort of like people. Next one, Caitlin. So I, I, had, to, I had to put Country Dancer, uh, which is a buck rose into uh, this image because of course I went to Iowa State University and when I was there, we, we talked about the buck roses. We had a number of these on our campus, specifically Country Dancer. That was a real favorite for a number of years. And the Morden series is one that I personally have had a lot of uh, experience with because these are really, really tough roses. I didn't have Fire Glow, that's one of the newer ones, but I did have um, several of the others that actually ended up blooming sometimes with, with very little care into November. And what's not to like about, about a plant that will give you beautiful flowers with very little care and live for years and years and years in the landscape. Next, Caitlin. So the knockouts. The knockouts probably are the rose that, that uh, set the rose world on fire when it finally came to what is, what is a shrub rose. You know, <laughs> some people, of course, think the knockouts are a knockout. I have to tell you that over time, Yes, they are very, very popular. They are not necessarily the best of the choices in my estimation for a shrub rose, really for a couple of reasons. Uh, again, the colors are a bit limited, mostly the reds. The yellow, again, is a little less stable than some of the other shrub roses. They, um, they bloom profusely in June, then they need a rest period. And, and that is, uh, I think that, that, again, that's a misconception about the shrub roses. They, they tend to be marketed and sold as ever blooming, uh, kind of like ever bearing strawberries. Yeah, they don't really ever bear, um, but they have to rest and then they'll flower again. And that's okay, 
but it's not if what a person is expecting is roses that bloom like an annual. They're also a shrub. And I should have said that at the beginning when I was talking about the shrub roses, a shrub is not a herbaceous plant. A shrub should not be cut back to the ground every single year and especially not in the fall. And we'll come to that uh, a little bit later. Next slide. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of the basics. Hopefully we'll get through it all. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is, uh, this is kind of what we're gonna talk about here. Location, purchase, plant, water, fertilize, prune, and pest control. Next slide. Location, location, location. Well-drained soil is a must for roses. They do not like their feet wet. They uh, like a slightly acid to a neutral pH. And again, you know, I, I, I talk about sort of the average plant, what they will tolerate and what they will prefer. They'll tolerate a little higher pH, a, a little alkaline. Their preference is kind of sitting there right in the middle. The sunlight is really essential. There are a handful of roses that will tolerate a little bit more shade, placing them in a location where you have east sun rather than west can be a, a great idea, especially for uh, colors that will fade pretty dramatically in the west sun. If you have a red rose, you don't really want it to turn pink the minute the, the sun gets hot. And again, that good air circulation is essential for roses for uh, especially reasons for disease and insect and pest control. Protection from the west sun and the wind, again, is going to allow those, those roses really to perform better in the landscape for longer. I use this as a, a little bit of an example because of course that Colorado blue spruce happens to also want full sun. That's a blue red and that's a blue green. So from a color standpoint in the landscape, those are two colors that really have a little bit of the same mix in them. And we, we have to hope the blue spruce stays put and the roses don't get much bigger because of course we're gonna have issues with that spacing. That happens all the time in the garden. And that gives you a great opportunity to tear something out and start over again. Next one. This is another example of placement and change over time, which is one of the elements I, <clears throat> excuse me, also talk about. Uh, this would happen to be Champlain Rose over there to the lower left. Tough rose, I still have this in my landscape. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat this morning. This is in a mixed perennial bed. And over time, the, the oak and everything else has completely shaded this garden out. So that rose is still there after 28 years. It still throws a handful of flowers, but a handful is, is really uh, what this rose does at this point. I like shrub roses or roses in association with herbaceous plants. The one uh, issue, of course, for any of you who work in a public space is again, that reminder to the people who are doing the management for you that a rose is not a herbaceous plant. You don't manage it exactly the same way you manage all those perennials. Next slide. So the purchase, um, bare root is still a, a way that you can purchase a lot of roses, especially from a lot of the tried and true traditional online or catalog suppliers of roses. And the grade is important, as is uh, really knowing that you're getting them from a good supplier. When the container industry really ramped itself up and allowed people to purchase plants essentially year round rather than just in the spring and just in the fall. Of course, roses also uh, went into those containers. They're usually sold in a number two. Uh, number one is fairly small for a rose. Number three, a little larger, a little more soil volume, of course, but maybe not necessarily the best way to purchase them depending on your supplier. Uh, and you can end up with a container rose not being great quality if it is not one that is current year's stock. I, I'm really pretty conservative in my experimentation with plants. I'll try anything, but what I usually don't gamble with is our very, very strange and, and stranger and stranger weather 
in Nebraska, and that would be 31 degrees below zero last week and 55 this week. And the same thing can happen in the spring and the same can, thing can happen in the fall. So I am not a proponent of purchasing and planting roses in the fall, unless you are willing to take that risk and really do a, a lot of care of those roses. You also then have to, of course, make the decision, are you using a root, a, a, a purchasing a rose on its own root or a grafted rose? Wonderfully now, most of the suppliers will tell you whether it is an own root rose or it is a grafted rose. And of course, those are uh, differences that do have a great deal to do both with survival and with the planting. Next slide. Planting. This is one of those uh, instances where we actually suggest amending the planting hole. And, and that really does, uh, of course, always go back to what is your soil to begin with. You've got to know that soil. And, and the, the, the hole itself, if you do the amendment at, before you plant with compost in particular, I'm, I'm a real proponent of good compost, you are likely to get that rose off to a better start. Epsom salts, which is kind of a, a fun and interesting uh, additive. We hear people talk all the time about Epsom salts on their rose or on their tomatoes. Well, one of the things Epsom salts does do for roses is allow calcium to be more readily available to the plant. We want to make sure the graft union is below grade, but not too far below grade. And own root roses are at grade. So identifying the, the graft union is very important, spreading those roots, digging that hole wide and shallow, not stamping or tamping that soil with your boots. I, I still see this happen all the time. It's, it's really kind of instinctive to just sort of tap that soil down with your boots. Do that, of course, with, with water instead. And yet again, are you getting the message that I think spring is really the best time to plant the roses? I think so. Next slide. Watering and fertilizing. Roses do like a drink. An inch or an inch and a half of water per week is ideal. And again, there, there's, there are going to be exceptions. I mentioned the rugosas earlier. The rugosas are going to tolerate uh, less water. They are heavy feeders, or you can choose the ones that really don't care. Uh, ideally, you're, you are perhaps going to use a mix of an organic and an inorganic fertilizer since they work so differently. And if you think about it, the organic fertilizers are typically going to be quite low in nutrients that might be needed at roses in particular times of the season. So that would be why you would use an inorganic fertilizer. A balanced NPK is ideal, 612-6, 512 5 um, other nutrients, depending on your soil situation. I mentioned Ep Epsom salts, some of the other macro and micronutrients can help if you are willing to do that work. If, if you really are, are after exhibition type roses or you just love to do that kind of amendment. Uh, granular or liquid fertilizers, both have their place with roses. You wanna do, you do wanna make sure that you're not going to be burning the roots of any newly planted rose. And again, seasonal change is really important. So when we talk about fertilizing, you want a little bit higher in in the spring as those shoots are being produced. The pea is next and, and you want that of course, a month later or during bloom time. And then K would be the fertilizer that is going to help with drought tolerance and hardiness through the winter. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are supplying that if necessary in the fall, but not too late. We don't fertilize roses after about mid-August, 1st of September. We're wanting them to shut down, not continue to put on that growth. Next slide. Time for a trim, what and why? So one of the ups and the downs of roses is they need haircuts pretty frequently. And if you either don't like to do that or you've gotten stabbed too many times to, to really enjoy it, a lot of roses is not going to be what you're going to want in your landscape. We start always with dead, damaged, or diseased wood. That, that should come out of the roses whenever you see it. We wanna take out the crossing canes or the ones that are really small. 
those, if they're crossing, that's going to be um, an invitation for wounding and an invitation for all those creepy crawlies and diseases that want to attack your roses. Small ones typically are just going to take resources away from the, the blooming canes. Any sprouts from the rootstock, so anything that is cut, if this is a grafted rose, anything coming from below the point of the graft union has to come off as soon as you see it. So that rose does not turn into uh, its root stock. We wanna increase circulation. That's one of the primary reasons that we open up the interior of a rose bush. Um, if we don't have good air circulation, we get less flowering, we get a lot of disease uh, potential within the, within the canopy of that plant certainly to re restore the shape. Uh, again, the modern breeding has, has produced a lot of roses that keep a pretty good shape, but every now and then, you know, there's a wild hair, a wild shoot that should come off. And of course, then to encourage flowering. And that has to do with whether you're going to deadhead, cut off the spent blooms, or as we get closer to the end of the season, allow the hips, if it's a rose that produces a lot of hips, to uh, really contribute to the winter landscape for that plant. Next slide. So here's an example of a rugosa that's really been unmanaged, of course, in, in winter character. So you could kind of see everything going on in there. And uh, again, the, you know, the beauty of being a gardener is that most gardeners are pretty diligent. They, they do uh, walk, walkabouts, wanderabouts, scoutabouts all the time. It's unlikely you're going to let a rose uh, get to this sort of condition. But if you do in the winter months is a good uh, opportunity to see exactly what you're going to take the, uh, those pruning shears to once it comes time to do that. Next slide. So uh, it is important really with, with uh, some of the roses in particular to know when they flower. And I mentioned earlier with the knockout series that the repeat bloomers do need a rest period. So once they have finished their initial flowering to, to go ahead and, and remove those spent flowers is important. Old roses and many of the climbers are going to bloom on previous years or old wood. Some are also going to flower on new wood. And some of the shrub roses again bloom on both. So, you know, being, being aware of what what really is going on with the roses will help you increase the flowering a bit. This is one of the beautiful big old climbers. This is, uh, this is William Baffin, which was at the governor's residence on the, on the fence and the gates for probably about 15 years until it became so big and so wild, it, it was a bit of a security issue for the, for the cameras. Next up. So I mentioned before, damaged and diseased wood is, is one of the first uh, prunings that we make. You have to go below the damaged site and above the closest bud eye. And depending on how severe the damage is or the disease, you might be taking a fair amount of that cane out of the rose. Um, sometimes the, the bud eyes are a little hard to find on some canes. I know uh, in one of my management classes, my students have the opportunity to prune the roses and a, a handful of them are, have the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bud eyes that are just barely, usually a, a pale pink little, little dot or pimple on the stem. Grafted plant suckers, again, I mentioned below the point of origin and any weak cane that is less than a quarter of an inch in diameter. Those should, those should come off uh, the rose too as you're, as you're looking at what to prune. Next up. Next slide, Caitlin. Okay, so let's talk about the rose wreckers. This is a, this is a big list, but it's probably only the partial list. So we have thrips, which of course a thrips is a single and thrips is as is, is are the plural or not. Aphids, miners, uh, mites, Japanese beetles, rose slugs or the sawfly larva, gall wasps, leaf cutter beetles, rose scales sitting there, cankers, black spots, powdery mildew, botrytis, rose mosaic, rose rosette, crown gall. 
And if you are unfortunate enough to have a rose that gets all of those sorts of wreckers, you probably don't have a rose any longer in your landscape. So we're gonna go through a handful of these relatively quickly. And of course, there is a lot of really good information out there about uh, specifics on chemical control. I'm not much of a chemical user, so I tend to go very IPM and streams of water are my best friend. Next slide, Kate. So this is a begone, whatever you are, first and best truly is IPM. Let's start with resistant selections. And again, with the great breeding that has gone on, uh, resistance to many of our diseases is built into them. Now resistant does not mean it won't ever get it, but of course resistant is better than not resistant. Sanitation is huge in managing roses. Sanitation during the entire season so that that inoculum or those overwintering pests are not just lying in wait. You also have to determine the acceptable damage, acceptable to you. What are you willing to live with as opposed to pulling out your arsenal and, and trying to make what is a living element perfect since none of us and none of them are perfect. Horticultural oils, neem, et cetera, are really, really great products to use on roses and uh, as are allowing those natural predators to do their work. So, so choosing those um, methods and, I, and of course, blasting with water, it's a lot of fun to blast, a, blast some creepy critter off of rose with a big old blast of water. Next slide. So just a handful here, thrips, leaf hoppers, those munchers. I get a kick out of uh, the damage that thrips do because there actually is a, a, uh, a shrub rose called freckles and freckles looks an awful lot like thrips damage. Of course, they, they can do a lot of damage, uh, ruin the flowers in particular. So scouting for these and keeping track of them is important. Thrips can have about 15 life cycles during a single season and uh, management can be pretty tricky. Next slide. Spider mites and aphids. Like thrips, these can do a fair amount of damage. You'll see the stippling, you'll see the, the webbing of the spider mites. Um, you'll, they will, again, attack the buds, attack the foliage. Oftentimes, again, uh, since they can be so aggressive, have more than one generation, many generations in the case of aphids, you might not be aware of the damage until it's really, really obvious. So that's a really good suggestion to go out and enjoy your roses on a really regular basis. Next slide. So control, I mentioned natural predators. And this again is one of the reasons to not, to not reach for that chemical control immediately. Let's let those natural predators get in there and do their, and do their work and control all those weedy alternate hosts as well. So, uh, that's one of the things that's also very important. Uh, and it makes it a little tricky to, uh, to do that if you're in a situation where you want those other plants to contribute to your landscape. The other is those water blasts and irrigation. So the water blast, just blasting them off the plant can make a big difference. Horticultural oils that I mentioned. Using, using the right oil at the right time can make a big difference. And the insecticides and the miticides can be a last resort. So keep those for a, a last resort as you're using that in your landscape. Next slide. Japanese beetles. Who has not experienced the Japanese beetles in your landscape? This is, uh, we were hoping that we would not have much of an infestation in Nebraska. We, we ended up seeing one or two or three about five years ago. And uh, we are collecting buckets worth of them now in our backyard farmer garden. And, and the damage they do is just, just amazing. It's, uh, roses happen to be one of their favorite foods. They have over 300 host plants. Um, our entomologists have done a really good, simple dealing with uh, Japanese beetles uh, guide, which is up there on the screen, which does give you um, good help on that. Of course, trapping them simply means you're going to be bringing them into your own landscape. Treating the grubs is a good idea. 
And plucking them off and drowning them in soapy water is either a lot of fun or it's a task that never finishes itself. Next up. So uh, rose slugs, I think we flew right by a little bit quickly. So let me talk about rose sawflies right quick. Rose sawflies are the, the little tiny greenish sort of worm looking thing that has a rasping mouth part. These are not caterpillars, so BT does not work on them. We have, uh, it's, it's really primarily a cosmetic damage. Again, that's one that is easily managed with a blast of water. And then I have to put in leaf cutter bees because look at the damage they can do, but isn't that so much fun? Those little bees put one foot down and then they swing a circle and they cut out paper hole punches. Again, mostly cosmetic, uh, as they are taking those pieces of leaves to provision their nests for their young, but they also do uh, get into the canes of the roses and that's where they make their, their bitty nests. So again, go back to that amount of damage that you are willing to put up with before you uh, reach for a chemical on that. Next slide, rose scale. You know, we had not had, uh, I don't believe for the, I can't remember when we had uh, much, if anything, for questions about rose scale. And this year we did. So, and this is one of the slides that we got sent to us for Backyard Farmer, which is, oh my goodness, look at all those creatures and critters on there. And again, treatment of scale as with scale on, on other uh, plants, you can, you can go to the uh, work of scraping them off with your fingernail. Smothering is really about your only choice, waiting for the crawlers, tapping, doing the diligence to be able to get rid of scales. If it's terrible, prune out those canes and get rid of them. Next slide. The spiny and mossy rose galls. These are just so cool and so strange. And uh, again, we had not seen them for a number of years and within the past three or four years, we're getting a fair number of questions about them. Uh, again, mostly cosmetic, caused by a, a little wasp, and uh, this comes all the way across the state. Uh, one of these pictures is from Scott's Bluff. The other I think is actually probably from Council Bluffs. And, and they, uh, that's what they look like. And, and again, you can pick them off, you can pluck them off. You can just sort of enjoy the fact that they, you have this, this interesting, strange thing on your rose. But again, they're mostly cosmetic as opposed to doing really significant damage. Next slide. Black spot and rust. Black spot is the bane of many rose growers. Start with resistant varieties if you possibly can. Go, of course, to good air circulation, good sanitation. Same thing is true on the rusts. So you wanna make sure that you are managing those well. Uh, and you may have to reach, in this case, for a fungicide to be able to get the quality of the roses that you want. Next slide. Stem cankers, I, I put a little bit more information here about this because it, they, they do enter wounds during wet or humid weather. Wilting foliage, twig dieback, black spot is also easily invaded by that fungus. So once again, keeping the black spot at bay is important. You do have to cut at least five inches below the point of the infestation or the infection and then disinfect your tools. Spray with a lime uh, sulfur fungus. Uh, uh, fungicide. So make sure that you keep pay attention to watching for that in your roses. Next slide. Powdery mildew. Uh, many different types of or, uh, cultivars seem to be very susceptible. Uh, the one on the left is pink gnome. The one on the right is one of the miniature roses. And again, this is so weather related and so so related to good air circulation. Uh, typically not something we treat, but again, selection for resistant roses is going to be important. Next slide. Rose rosette. The fortunate thing about rose rosette is uh, Texas A&M has uh, started a grant, collaborative grant in 2014. It was renewed in 2020. Significant research is going on on managing rose rosette, identifying it well. Um, the pest has been identified. 
finding the markers that will help build in resistance to roses. Uh, some of the research is now showing that in some cases you can prune the affected canes out if you catch them early enough. And uh, mostly, especially if it is significant as is in the picture on the right, getting that, getting that uh, rose out of the landscape is really important. Multiflora rose, which is an invasive species across the country, is one of the culprits for this. Uh, roses that have multiflora in the parentage appear to be more susceptible to it. You can replant in the same location if you have, if you have managed to get rose rosette out of the landscape. I know we lost, uh, I think, about 75 roses in one location on campus to Rosette uh, a number of years ago because it was, uh, first off, it was in that particular cultivar variety. So watch for those wild shoots that are reddish or the soft, crazy canes. One of the things that's hard to identify uh, this um, with this also is roses that bloom red tend to have red in their, in their early foliage. So don't automatically assume you've got Rosette uh, because you may not have it. But that's really exciting research going on. And there are a couple of resistant varieties, or, or at least so far resistant, that uh, are on the market now. Next slide. So do we have nutrition? Do we have viral? What do we have going on here with, with these particular roses? And again, one of the, one of the, one of the downsides of so many um, either nutritional deficiencies or viral is, uh, or disease is you, you really do need to, to take advantage of extension and pathology and entomology to get, to get those identified before you randomly reach for whatever you think is going to fix, fix the situation. This ended up uh, being something that was uh, both environment as you look at where this poor thing is planted and um, they suspected it was uh, uh, more nutrition than anything else. Next slide. So rose mosaic is one of the reasons that we uh, want to control aphids because the aphids can spread it really rapidly. And of course, aphids have multiple uh, generations. Spraying them off with water is good, but of course they fly and move around. Sooty mold can be associated with, of course, aphids as well. So making sure you know what is going on is really, really essential. Next slide. This is a classic example of reversion. And uh, yes, no, that's not two different roses. That is one rose blooming profusely from the rootstock. Oftentimes what you'll see instead is um, a, a long, one very, very long cane, one or two long canes. And it may be a blind cane, which means no flowering. Or all of a sudden, instead of having that beautiful double or triple uh, excellent red rose, you've got a single pink. So, you know, once reversion in a rose has, has taken over a third or a half of the plant, you're gonna have to do a, a, a pretty fair amount of pruning out of that uh, wood if you think you're going to be able to save the plant. This is also a pretty tough location. That rose is squashed against a, a brick building. It is. It is mulched with rock. There's um, some turf in front of it. Um, that rose is, is kind of in a bad location at this point. Next slide. Winter woes. We have no idea what we're going to see this spring for the roses. Uh, initially, we thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be a year when even the toughest of the tough is not going to uh, be able to come out of what we've had for winter conditions. But interestingly enough, we had, uh, we had so much snow cover here, at least in Lincoln, that our ground temperature three days ago was 32 degrees. So we didn't really even get much freezing. And of course that snow was a great insulating blanket. Um, that said, we could see a lot, of, a lot of winter dieback in roses that were either marginally hardy or perhaps in a compromised location. So there, there's um, always the temptation to go in and start pruning away rapidly. We do not prune roses, if at all possible, until after that last frost. 
that can be hard because you know here here they sit with all that that nasty dead cane material in them but we're just notorious for having late freezes or late frosts and of course what happens if you prune early is that wound is going to cause additional dieback you're going to have to come in and do it a, a, a additional pruning later so um, we always try to wait as long as we possibly can to prune out the dead and the damaged. Uh, and by then, of course, you're probably likely to see where the new growth is going to appear. The rose on the lower left, of course, is pretty obvious. We're going to have to prune out a lot of canes on that one. Next slide. Come, this is what we do, and that's weed control. And what you are seeing is glyphosate damage on one of the roses. So again, if you're in a situation where perhaps it's a landscape management company or a turf company or, or um, somebody who really doesn't, really doesn't fully understand the, the impact that glyphosate can have on roses, it's devastating. It's the colored canes of the roses will take up the chemical really rapidly. And roses damaged by glyphosate have a really, really tough time recovering. So you're better off, of course, giving them a good base of mulch, doing what, of course, is either a lot of fun or, or a real pain, and that is ho, 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 or pull, 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 to get those, um, those weeds out of your landscape. Next slide. Tree roses. This one I just get the biggest kick out of. They are just so beautiful. If you, uh, if you look at where they're sold and, and uh, who has done the grafting for them, they're usually on high standards. They are beautiful like this. Next slide. And this is what you might end up with. Um, one of our rose gardens in Lincoln uses tree roses and every single year, you've got a, a larger stake holding them upright than you do a rose on the top and pretty significant suckering from the graft union, usually at the base. They're a really tough plant uh, to, to keep looking good. So keep that in mind. Um, they're not inexpensive, but maybe it is something if you really want one on your patio, you're going to choose one that is going to almost act as an annual. And the patio petites are smaller roses that are being developed. There's now actually a petite knockout, which will be interesting to see, you know, how small is small. The, the flowers are smaller on that one. Next slide. So a couple that are really interesting and, and new or newer. It's, it's always also fun to see how long ago the roses were released and how long it's taken them to be considered new to somebody. Burst of joy, I happen to be a real fan of orange. And I know a lot of people don't think of orange as a color. They don't like orange or the salmon -y sorts of colors that, uh, and look at the form. So that's another thing that uh, has been bred into a lot of the newer roses, which is the classic rose form, uh, as opposed to the single petal wild or nearly wild kind of appearance. So there's a couple of them. Uh, Easy Elegance series, again, is one of the ones that is releasing a lot of roses. Next slide. Here's, here's uh, Coral Cove and Cashmere, a couple of the others, <clears throat> excuse me, that have been released. And uh, interestingly enough, there are 111 roses in the current catalog of one of our local suppliers here. 111, 13 climbers, 41 of them are hybrid teas or grandifloras, and then various numbers of the others, but 111 in one single garden center. Next slide. Superhero is, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the new modern take on my hero. Top Gun, which is at the very top there, is the resistant to Rose Rosette, newest red rose. So that is one of the ones on the market now that um, seems to have in it the resistance to Rose Rosette. And then Polar Express is a pure white. So multiple, multiple choices for roses in your landscape. It, it's all, it can be almost overwhelming. Choose by what you want that rose to do and be. Choose by what you want to do to manage that rose, knowing full well that 
These are not a set it and forget it plant unless you choose the, the wild types or really don't mind the damage. Choose by color, of course, but location, location, location is so very important in making sure those roses are going to give you what you want. Next slide. And in the landscape, even though this is a little bit of a washed out late fall sun in the wrong location, look over there on the left and you can see one of the rugosas that is actually one of the hybrids. This is a very old, old rose. It's been in place on campus for 30 years. Going into a little bit of fall color, little bit of hips, grasses in the background, that's catmint in the foreground, and that's a November slide. So it's still showing some of the beauty that you can get from the shrub roses. And on that note, I believe that is my very next to almost last. So run for them or run from them. And look at what I have here, which is one of the scrambler rambler roses with a a pure white clematis intertwined amongst it, showing those fabulous seed heads. Really enjoyed talking to you. I guess I talked, you listened. I hope you learned something on this one. Yeah, we'll go ahead and give a minute here in case anybody has any questions. Uh, Kim, I didn't know if you wanted me to go back to that slide that I accidentally passed over so that folks could kind of see that one. <laughs> you can if you wish, because it does show the uh, it does show the uh, the little slug dudes. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can go ahead and pull that up. Um, sorry about that. My oh, you know my keyboard had gotten a little stuck. <laughs> you know that happens, or else I have fat fingers sometimes. <laughs> so this is there's actually uh, this is really the one most common, the sawfly larva. You can see those dreadful little green worm-like things, they're always on the underside of the leaves and they have those rasping mouth parts. And usually people will say, well, I don't see any insects. And that's because they're on the underside. So that's what, and they grow fast, the darn little things. So there they are doing their rosy damage. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, not a problem. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions uh, so far. So what I'm gonna do quick, um, oh, we just got one in. I'll go ahead and pop it on the screen there. Where can you find shrub roses? What a great question. Uh, Rachel, there are multiple, multiple online sources for shrub roses that are very good. So yes, the garden centers often do have limited supplies of the ones that they know will sell well, um, but Antique Rose Emporium, Heirloom Garden Roses, Jackson and Perkins, Weeks, I probably, I, I tend to, I'm old, I still like paper. <laughs> so I still get some paper catalogs, but if you go online uh, you will, and you maybe you just ask for sources for shrub roses, you'll see all sorts of sources. Oh boy, number one, one and a half and two bare root roses is how they are graded. And it has to do with the number of canes on the rose. So it's really the size of the cane and the strength of the cane, Jan, um, you're, you're usually, if, again, if you go to a, a good supplier, you're not going to get a low grade rose. So you want the robustness of, of those, uh, those canes on the roses. Awesome. I'm going to quick just show everyone um, where you can find the evaluation. If you check in the chat box uh, for the folks that are on Facebook, live, I sent a direct link there. Um, but also if you are watching on YouTube or on our website page, you can go over to the speakers tab. And if you go down to Kim's session, you can click there and you will find the link uh, to the evaluation. So if you guys wanna go there and fill that out, your feedback is very important to us. Uh, there's also an opportunity for folks that maybe are on the website and didn't get a chance to ask questions there's a spot where you can put in your contact information and questions and we can pass that along to Kim as well. So if you guys have any any questions that you couldn't get in the chat box or anything that pops up later, uh, you can get in contact uh, with Kim through the evaluation link as well. And we are close to starting Backyard Farmer on the first Thursday in April. And of course, we try to answer every single question we get in some fashion. So, <laughs> and it won't be time to prune those roses yet. 
Yes. Awesome. Well, we have no more questions. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Kim. And uh, remember, we do have another session coming up at 3 p.m. Central Time today, uh, Busting Garden Myths with Benjamin. Uh, so we hope that you guys can all join us and we'll see you there. Thanks so much.